Okay, good day everyone. This is the last part of the lecture series on Rizal in the context of 19th century Philippines. The focus this time will be on the religious development. Now, we have already discussed about the three, economic, political, and cultural developments. Now, we go into the last part, which is the religious development. Now, when we look at the religious developments, we have to first understand the two parties involved. The first were the friars, the second were the illustrados. Now, when you look at the friars, actually there are two types of priests during the uh, uh, colonial period, the seculars and the friars. More about that we'll discuss later on when we talk about the secularization controversy. But nonetheless, there was a struggle between the friars and the illustrados. Now, this was mainly because of philocracy. The Philippines was a philocracy before. Governor generals may come and go, but the friars remained intact. The friars were basically the most influential individuals in the Philippines. Philocracy was what Marcelo del Pilar called the Philippines because it was predominantly ruled by friars. Friars used religion to maintain Spanish influence in the colony. So as I've said a while ago, governor generals might come and go, but the friars remained permanently in the colony. Now, they were devoted to Spain and were highly influential among the natives. The friars, in fact, were used by the Spanish officials to uh, maintain Spanish rule over the Philippines. They were also utilized by the state. And uh, they were used, in fact, as political instruments to maintain Spanish loyalty. They were considered as the most evil of all men by Rizal. And more importantly, as I've said a while ago also, they were used as political instruments. You have to take note of that. They were used as political instruments to maintain Filipino loyalty to Spain. Now, if you look at the situation today, of course, we segregate religion from the government because uh, there is a separation between the church and the state as written in our constitution. But before there was no separation between church and state, church and state was considered as one. Hence, they became the targets of the illustrados. Now, the reason why there was a union between the church and the state is because of the Patronato Real. The Patronato Real was an agreement between the Pope and the Spanish monarch, which gave the Spanish monarch and its colonial authorities power over the church and the clergy in the colonies. This was a result of, you know, it was like a gift from the Pope. The Pope gave uh, the Spanish monarch a gift because they were responsible for driving out the Muslims from the Iberian Peninsula. So, as a result, they were then given influence and power over the church and the clergy in their colonies. So, one very important uh, figure in the religious development in the Philippines is Father Jose Burgos. He was responsible for the continuation of the secularization advocacy, which he continued uh, which he continued as what Father Pedro Pelaez started. He continued what Pet Pedro Pelaez started because Pedro Pelaez, his mentor, died uh, suddenly. Uh, it was uh, from an earthquake of 1863. He was in the Manila Cathedral. While, while he was there, there was a big earthquake and rubble fell uh, on him. Uh, be that as it may, we have to look at the secularization controversy first. What was the secularization controversy all about? So, as I've said a while ago, there are two types of priests, regulars and the seculars. Now, the regulars were the friars. Similar to synonymous to sila. Friars and regulars are the same. Now, the friars, their main goal was to... to uh, uh, spread the gospel. Their main goal was to go on missions. They were missionaries to go to faraway places, to isolated places to spread the gospel. That was their main goal. Uh, friars were mostly Spanish or Spaniards. Uh, there were no Filipinos, Filipino friars. A Filipino cannot become a friar. 
Filipino priests, however, were known as seculars. Now, seculars were supposed to, they were in charge of uh, uh, handling or administering the parishes, the churches. So they were like the diocesan priests of the day. So they're like the diocesan priests of today who administer parishes from different towns and cities within the province. No? So that's the difference between the two. The regulars or the friars were missionaries. The seculars, on the other hand, were administrators of parishes. So where did, how did the fight begin? How did, how did it start? Well, it all started, although this, this, uh, this is a complicated topic and it would take time for us to discuss this, but let me just simplify it as much as possible. Uh, it started with the friars taking over the churches. Now, in the 19th century, there was an influx of Filipino priests. There were more and more secular priests during that time. But before the 19th century, there was a need for secular priests. Since there was a need for secular priests, the regulars, since there was uh, a limited number of secular priests, the regulars were then assigned to the parishes, which was supposed to be the job of the seculars. Be that as it may, by the 19th century, because of the influx of the number of secular priests, uh, the seculars were now demanding to administer the parishes because they didn't have any parishes to administer given that the friars or the regulars were the ones administering it already. So they wanted their job back. But then the regulars did not want to leave the parishes. So one might ask why? Why didn't they want to leave the parishes? Well, there are several answers to that question. One, influence. If they left the parishes, they would lose influence. Two, money. If they left the parishes, they would also lose money because they gain a lot of money by administering the parishes. One student of mine before asked, how will they get money from the parishes? Well, there are many ways. If you are the parish priest in a certain town or in a certain city, you can get money, money in various ways, like from the collection, that's one. Uh, secondly, this was during the Spanish period, okay, not, not, not at present. But second, according to the Illustrados, one way of getting money, according to them, was that the regulars abused the, uh, the gullibility. No? The Filipinos were very gullible. So the regulars abused this uh, credulousness of Filipinos and or the naivety of the Filipinos and they abused this by taking advantage of this trait. How did they take advantage of that? Well, according to some illustrators, if you remember, whenever there is a dying man, we would always call on a priest to say the last rites or to offer the last rites. Now, as the story goes, as the illustrators uh, recalled, the, uh, the priest, the regular priest or the friar would always tell the dying man after giving the last rites and they would secretly tell the dying man, if you, if you give your money or your assets to the church, then you will be assured a spot in heaven. Of course, if you are a dying person and you hear this, you would always say, okay, I would give my money and my assets to the church because who doesn't want to go to heaven, right? So after doing this, of course, the pri we would never know if they went to heaven or not. How would the priest know that they would go to heaven? And they sila pwede mo balik. Ingon sila nga, naabot na misa. No, we, 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 we arrived in heaven. No, they cannot do that. It's, 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 it's impossible to do that. It's virtually impossible to do that. But you see the manipulation here. The priest telling the dying person that if you give an, as if you give an asset, your land, or if you give your money to the church, then you will be assured a spot in heaven. And that's very terrible. That's a very egregious thing to do. So, as a result, uh, they gained a lot of money, they gained a lot of uh, influence over, over, the, uh, over the people. And that's why they did not want to leave the parishes. 
those are the friars. So, another thing that Father Burgos fought for was equality between regulars and seculars. Because the seculars were considered as inferior beings to the regulars. They were indeed considered as inferior priests by the regulars, given that they were Filipinos. And then later on, he was able to transform that ecclesiastical conflict to a larger issue of Filipino equality with the Spaniards. So instead of fighting for equality between seculars and regulars, he then started to fight for equality between uh, between Filipinos and Spaniards. And this this uh, idea was quite dangerous. It was a very dangerous idea. And this eventually led to his arrest and uh, and execution. But the friars were very good. They did not use this, but in reality, this was the reason. The idea was the reason. But in re but they were able to find another justification as to why they would arrest Father Jose Burgos, and we'll discuss that later on. So Father Burgos then became a threat to the friars and the Spanish colonial government in the Philippines. As a result, he, along with Father Gomez and Zamora, were accused of starting the Cavite mutiny. But in reality, the Cavite mutiny was not the the end result of Father Gomez, Burgos, and Zamora's, uh, how do you say this, uh, actions. It was actually started by Sergeant La Madrid, a disgruntled officer who, who started a revolt because he did not want to uh, go back and pay uh, taxes and go and do forced labor. He didn't want to go back to that. So he started the revolt in Cavite. But then, but then, uh, the Spaniards, more so the friars, blamed Father Burgos for starting it because they accused him of wanting to become the king of the Philippines. Which was not all, which which was not the case because Father Burgos simply wanted equality between Filipinos and Spaniards. So eventually, as a result, they were arrested, convicted, and then later on executed via the garrote. Now Father Burgos was not guilty, of course. We all know this. Father Gomez and Father Zamora also were not guilty. Father Gomez was a very old priest already. He was around, I think, more than 70 years old. Father Zamora was still quite young, but the thing about Father Zamora was that he was in Cavite during the Cavite mutiny. So he was blamed for, as one of, he, was, he was blamed as one of the uh, purveyors of the Cavite mutiny. Father Burgos, who was the main target, of course, uh, was, was, was blamed as the head of the mutineers. And they even had a witness that would prove that Father Burgos was the leader of the Cavite mutiny. And they, they the friars convinced this certain witness to, to witness against Father Burgos. And as, as a payment for his uh, testimony, he would then be set free because the witness was one of the members of the Cavite mutiny. He was one of the, uh, how do you say this? He was one of, uh, you can't really say member of the Cavite mutiny, but he was one of the participants in the Cavite mutiny. So, uh, this certain person named Mr. Saldua then witnessed against Father Burgos, Gomez, and Zamora and told the court that they were the ones who led them during the Cavite mutiny. The promise by the Spaniards if he would testify was that he would be set free. But then when the, when the judge made the decision to execute Father Gomez, Burgos, and Zamora, he also included Mr. Saldua, the witness, as a person to be executed also. So the promise was a lie. And the testimony was futile because 
gipramisan siya nga buyan siya but then after after the case has been heard or after the case had been heard he was also part of he was also included in the people to be executed imagine being that person being deceived by the friars so mr saldua was also executed by the garote uh, why was he also executed well so that he will not be able to speak the truth so that the truth will not be set free and the truth will be buried six feet below the ground so there was an eyewitness account of the execution of father gomez burgos and zamora as the eyewitness said the first person to be executed was father gomez father gomez according to the eyewitness was very calm he was ready to accept his fate he was ready to die the second person to be executed was zamora it's not burgos it doesn't follow that it's gomburza burgos would be the second person to be executed no the second person to be executed was zamora and according to the eyewitness account, Zamora was already dead even before he was executed, metaphorically speaking. Since he could not believe, he was already dead inside. He could not believe that he was part of, he was accused as being part of the Cavite mutiny simply because he was in Cavite during the Cavite mutiny. So, according to the eyewitness account, he was already dead inside. Mura na og na nabuang nagamay. So, the third person to be executed was Father Burgos, and the last one was Father Burgos. They saved the best for last. And Father Burgos, who was the main target, according to the eyewitness, was crying like a child. He was weeping like a child. He did not want to die during that fateful day, uh, Fe February of 1872. He did not want to die. Father Burgos did not want to die. Uh, so... Uh, he was weeping like a child. He was, uh, he was shouting, I'm not guilty, I'm not guilty. When he arrived at the platform uh, and he was shouting, I'm not guilty, one of the friars said, so was Jesus Christ. And that was a very snarky remark by the friar. It was uh, quite an insulting remark even because they knew that Jesus was not guilty of his crimes and yet he was still crucified. Just like Father Burgos, they knew that he was not guilty of his crimes but still he would die via the garrote. Now as the story goes, the executioner then asked for forgiveness for what he was about to do to Father Burgos. And after hearing the executioner ask for forgiveness, Father Burgos calmed down and he prayed to the executioner and forgave him. And then he prayed to the Lord. And that was the end of it afterwards. It was a public execution. Uh, many Filipinos saw the execution via Garote. And if you look at this picture, this is a picture of the Garote. I do not know how it feels to be garroted because I don't know, is it painful or not? I don't know if it's painful or not. But they say you die a quick death because once your neck will snap, then you immediately die. So that's a picture of the garrote. They just twist the handle at the back until, and the grip will tighten and tighten until your neck will break and that will be the end of you. So, Father Gomez Burgos and Zamora were executed via the garrote. And after their execution, there was complete silence. People did not talk about them. It was taboo to talk about them. And uh, no one dared to support. Those who supported them, those who sympathized with them, were sent to exile or arrested. So, how did this accelerate Filipino nationalism? How did it lead to the acceleration of Filipino nationalism? There, well, there were three. The first one is the influence of Father Jose Burgos. Father Jose Burgos undoubtedly influenced Rizal and uh, his ideas. Remember, Father Burgos fought for equality between Filipinos and Spaniards. And that was also Rizal's idea. This was the result of the secularization controversy because the seculars wanted to take the job of the regulars, wanted to take back their job. But then the regulars did not give it back to them because they wanted money, they wanted the influence, and they wanted the power in the towns. Supposedly the people who would administer the parishes were the seculars, but then they did not get their job back because... Uh, 
the regulars did not want to give in. They did not want to go back to their original job, which was to become, uh, which was to go on missions. So the influence of Father Burgos to Rizal was one of the accelerators of Filipino nationalism. The second one is frilocracy. The Filipinos already had enough of friar rule. So they wanted to get rid of the friars and this somehow instilled in them a, a nationalistic zeal, a nationalistic vigor that they wanted to, you know, they wanted to get rid of the friars and wanted to expel them. They became enemy number one to the Filipinos. And then the last is the execution of Gumburza. The execution of Gumburza eventually led to the creation of the propaganda movement years, decades after more than a decade after. So the propaganda movement, if you know this, was responsible for the creation of the newspaper known as the La Solidaridad. Members of the propaganda movement were illustrados and their main goal was to fight for reforms, uh, to make the Philippines a province of Spain, and to expel the friars. And they undoubtedly, even if they had if, even if they didn't totally have the same nationalistic ideas as Bonifacio, they were responsible for influencing the rise of the Katipunan. Because Bonifacio read the La Solidaridad and Bonifacio also read about Rizal, read Rizal's works, the Noli and the El Fili, and other works of some illustrados. So all these three accelerated Filipino nationalism. And this is part of the religious development of the Philippines in the 19th century. So this ends our discussion for the religious development. Uh, for our next topic, Rizal's early years and early education, I'll be giving you some notes on this. And I just want you to read it. And maybe I'll be giving you an assignment for that by next week. But please do take note of these, these uh, religious developments. I might be giving the exam probably two weeks from now. Uh, I'll give you a long exam. Might, we, we might consider it as a midterm exam. So I'll be giving you an exam. And the coverage will be uh, Rizal in the 19th century Philippines, economic, political, cultural, and religious developments, and the early years and education of Rizal. So I'll be giving the early years and education of Rizal by next week. It's not going to be a video or a YouTube video, but it's going to be some notes, annotations of his early years and education. And I just want you to download that and take note of it. So that's it. That ends our discussion. I hope you view this video. And uh, I wish you well. Keep safe and uh, stay away from harm. God bless and have a great day.